Hey everyone, thanks for uh, coming along to another Quality Advocates event. Uh, just, just a quick intro, we, we've had a number of these events running uh, this month and we've got a couple of more um, over this week and next as well. Um, but really pleased to, to have Sufjan give his talk once more on the conundrum of test automation. Uh, so this was a really great talk. Um, Sufjan actually gave this, I think it was two, maybe three months ago, Sufjan. Uh, March 12th. March 12th. <laughs> there you are. Um, which seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, but because a couple of the people missed out, um, we thought we, we'd share it once more, but this time online. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Sufjan. Sufjan, over to you. Thanks, Billy. Can you see my screen? Uh, the conundrum of test automation title slide. I can. All good. Great. Thanks for sharing. Great. Sounds good. Well, thank you everybody for joining this evening. I'm really, really excited uh, that Billy invited me back. I guess I did pretty well the first time around, so got an invite. I want to also thank Billy for all the work that he's doing with uh, Quality Advocates. Uh, it's been really great uh, so far. And now that we've kind of gone virtual, it's opened up new avenues for for us in the meetup world, um, for this talk, I actually tried uh, some doing some of my own marketing and uh, trying to recruit people to come on. And I was thinking for a minute, hang on there, we're virtual now, so I could technically invite people from all over the world. And that's kind of the benefit of being virtual uh, is you really have the world as your oyster. So uh, something to think about. Um, as if any of you are considering going into speaking and giving talks, virtual meetups are a great place to do that. And uh, Quality Advocates is a great place to uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, so huge shout out to Billy for arranging this and, and making this all virtual, making this all possible. So I'm here today to talk to you about the conundrum of test automation. And this is an interesting question. So you may have when, when you think of the conundrum of test automation, different things may come to mind. And each organization and each company has their own struggles. But what I wanna share with you today is kind of my conundrum when it comes to test automation and how I'm going about dealing with it and trying to resolve the conundrum that I have with test automation. So just to give a brief introduction of who I am, I, I, I'm Sufyan Faruqi. Uh, I have uh, over 15 years of experience in QA. Uh, I came straight into QA industry by accident out of university, as most people do uh, when they fall into QA. And uh, I've been in QA ever since. Quality has really become my passion. And uh, through that experience, I've, I've learned a number of things. And what I wanted to share with you guys today is my conundrum when it comes to test automation. And I've seen this at every, almost every organization I've been at that's wanted to introduce automation. They always struggle with this question. The question is, what do I automate? So companies are very eager to get automation, get tools, uh, make the investment in tools and Sometimes these can be very, very expensive. If you remember uh, some years ago, and it's, it's still around actually, HP ALM, it's called now. Back then it was called something else. I believe it was Quality Center. And then they had an automation plugin. Um, so even in those days, you know, this, there was this huge investment being made by a company I used to work at. And the CIO came in and said, okay, now... We have this tool, we spent X thousands of dollars investing in this tool. Now we have to go and automate everything. Um, and then I've seen other companies where they have a stack of test cases and maybe 600 test cases, a thousand test cases, whatever. They have this huge pile of manual tests and they're like, they set up a whole team just for automation. And they give this pile of test cases to the automation team and they say, okay, go through and start automating these. We want to automate all of these test cases. And then more recently, a couple jobs ago, they were kind of doing automation on the side uh, to all of the other QA manual stuff that we were doing. And what we decided there was we want to automate all the bugs. 
So that's another approach that, that I've seen being taken. But again, the, the common theme in all of this is you have this great tool, but it's given to QA and they're told to go and automate it. And then you're left wondering, okay, I have this tool, I have the framework, but now what do I automate? And what I hope to share with you throughout this presentation are kind of tips and tricks for how we can figure that out and how we can figure that out, leveraging some of the things that we already know and we have available to us. So I joined a company called Housey in June of 2019. And I came in as the QA lead. And coming in as a QA lead, obviously, you know, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be set up when it comes to quality assurance. One of the things that needed to be set up was automation. So I'm not of the philosophy that automation is the silver bullet and that everything needs to be automated. I, my experience told me that that's not probably the route that I want to go. That is a route. There are some companies that decide to do that, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, if that's that the best route or not is debatable. I personally believe that a good QA organization or a good chapter in QA at a, at a company will have a level of automation in place, but automation is not the be all and end all. And automation isn't going to be our saving grace. There is definitely still a space and a place for manual exploratory testing. And it's a very, very important part of QA. But I did know that at Housey, a slice of the pie was going to be automation and I needed to get that in place. So I knew we would need automation. And the first step, once I knew that I needed automation, is to pick a tool. So the first question that really came up was what tool should I pick? And this is a tough question because there are different tools out there that I could use. I could ask my boss for thousands and thousands of pounds and invest in this huge tool. But then you also have other things like Selenium. Um, you have tools like Cypress. You have all these different tools that have come to the market. So I needed to somehow filter down the tool that I wanted to use. And it was hard for me to decide what I wanted. Also at Housey, we use Laravel. And another opportunity would have been to use the Laravel framework. That was also an option. And that was something that I discussed with the developers at Housey about you know, the possibilities of doing that. So I had this array of automation tools in front of me and I needed to decide which one to take. I didn't know which, which tool to pick, but what I did know is that there are certain criteria that I definitely didn't want. And here's what I narrowed it down to. I didn't want Selenium. So at past organizations, I've worked with people that have set up Selenium. I've tried to set up Selenium myself and it's a complete mess and a nightmare. It makes me wanna pull out my hair and scream. So I definitely knew I didn't want Selenium. I also knew that I wanted something that was quick and easy to set up. And lastly, I wanted literally something that I could install, um, start running, hit, hit the play button, and it just works straight out of the box. So these were kind of the process of elimination. So if it wasn't quick and easy to set up, it was out of my pile. If it wasn't something I could start using right away, I'd, I'd put it to the side. Uh, and this really narrowed my choices down to tools that I wanted to use. And at the end of the day, what we decided on was to go with Cypress. So I introduced Cypress to Housey and installed it on my machine and actually conducted a POC for a couple tests in Cypress to see how easy it would be to install and set up. And I demoed it and it worked great. Uh, so Cypress was, was the tool to, of choice for Housey. If I could request those of you that are unmuted to mute yourself just to avoid the background noise. Thank you. 
um, and there'll be sufficient time at the end for questions as well. And feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat as we go along. So we decided to go with Cypress. So that's it, right? We have our tool. Let's start automating. But wait, the question was still outstanding of what do I automate? So again, going back to what I mentioned at the top was that you have the tool, the tool's only step one, but then the question is what do you automate and how do you go about defining that strategy? So as I mentioned, I did a POC. So that is one way to figure out how to automate. For the POC, what I did was I picked two random tickets out of a sprint that we were working on and I said, okay, these are good front end things that I can probably put together during the course of this, this two week sprint. And then I can demo it to the team. That's how I picked what I wanted to automate for the POC. That works really well for a POC is just pick something at random, pick something that's quick and easy that you can get done in a sprint. But is it the best approach for um, your automation strategy? Probably not. So, the answer to this, I still didn't know. I still didn't know what to automate. I kind of did because there's a bunch of different things I could do based on my past experience. So like I mentioned earlier, do I automate every test case? Do I just automate random stuff like I did for the POC? Uh, how do I decide? Um, and, and what I had to do here was kind of reflect and I took a step back and I reflected on my past experiences and what I had in what I like to call my testing toolbox. So when I look at my toolbox, these are the three things that kind of came out and that I felt like I could draw on. Number one was the testing pyramid. So the testing pyramid is in some people's eyes, not the best model, uh, but I think it's something that's actually has some traction in the QA industry. Uh, quite a, a lot of people use it and it's, it served its purpose well, so it's a good guide. Uh, but I thought there might be something there that I can, something more that I can get out of this testing pyramid that has become quite popular. The other thing, that I had in my toolbox, and this is something that I love about the development team at Housey, is when I joined Housey, the developers were already writing unit tests. This is a huge plus. If your devs are already writing unit tests, that's something that you definitely want to embrace. That's something you wanna leverage. That's something that you wanna get involved in as much as possible not necessarily writing the unit test per se, but uh, talking to the devs, understanding their unit tests, maybe getting involved in, in the review process of the unit tests to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and adding your QA mentality, your QA mindset to the unit test suite as well. So I had that in my toolbox and this was one thing that really made me smile again when I joined Housey. If your developers are not writing unit tests currently, then this is probably a good place to start, is to figure out ways to encourage and inspire and demonstrate the value of unit tests to your developers so that they do start writing unit tests. And the last thing that I had, the third thing that I had in my toolbox is this thing called Agile Scrum, which we're all familiar with. So maybe there's something there that I can leverage as well. So this was, these were the three things in my toolbox that I wanted to leverage. So I started with the two things, two, two, the top two things, sorry. And like I mentioned, the devs were already writing unit tests and the testing pyramid. So I'm pretty sure everyone here has seen the testing pyramid before. Uh, it was introduced by Mike Cohen. And when Mike Cohen introduced it, he introduced it as, as kind of a guide or um, something that people could look at and figure out automation 
at some level. So when you look at the test pyramid, we have the unit tests at the bottom, you have the service tests in the middle, kind of a bigger chunk, and then you have the UI tests at the, at the top, which are smaller. And the reason that they're smaller is because they're, they're not supposed to be as many um, unit tests, or they're not supposed to be as many UI tests as there are service and unit tests. That's kind of the philosophy, and that's what the testing pyramid really tells us. So with my developers already writing unit tests, I thought, okay, what if we put the developers at the bottom working their way up the pyramid, and at the same time, I work from the top down on the pyramid, and then eventually we'll meet somewhere in the middle. So this sounded like a, a good way to start, but it still didn't answer kind of the question of what do I automate? And the pyramid doesn't answer that question for us. It tells us maybe how much, but it doesn't tell us what. For the devs, it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. They have a really clear path on what they need to automate at the unit test level, because a developer would write a piece of code and then they would write tests for that code to test that functionality. So I write X and then I wanna test X. I write Y, I wanna test Y. Um, and it's very clear cut. But for the, for the QA, when you get up to the top of the pyramid at the UI level and into the service level a little bit, uh, it's still very, very unclear. But because of the way that the per testing pyramid set up, it does tell me that I don't want to automate every single scenario. How does it tell me that? It tells me that because it is indeed a triangle and the UI piece is the smallest piece of that triangle, is at the top of the triangle. So it should be small, it should be robust. If I was automating every, every test scenario, every scenario, every, every test case, then it would no longer be a pyramid, it would look more like a ice cream cone. And some organizations have that. But the testing pyramid tells us that that's probably not the best way. So this allowed me to eliminate that, the fact that I do not want to automate every scenario. I want to share a story with you all now. And the story is about my daughter. So a few years ago, my daughter, Isa, was in nursery. And she one day was getting dismissed from, from, from school and her teacher called my wife and said, can you come here for a second? And my wife came in uh, towards the door of the classroom and, and asked the teacher, yes, what, what's going on? And the teacher says, can I speak to you for, for a few minutes? And my wife was a bit concerned. She said, has Isa done something wrong? Is she in trouble? These were the thoughts going through my wife's mind that she later told me. And she was concerned and the teacher says, yeah, but can you come in? And now my wife's really like, okay, she must've done something really bad that her teacher's calling her into the classroom. Um, but my wife went into the classroom and, and the teacher walked her over my wife and my daughter to this table. And on this table were these random objects, like the object that my daughter's holding there in her hand. And basically the teacher told my wife that this is, this is what Isa's as is made. And my wife looks at it and she's like, oh, okay, um, that's great. And the teacher says, Isaac, can, or my wife then goes on to inquire, like, what is it? And the teacher asks Isa to explain to her mom what she's, what she's made. So my daughter goes on to explain this. And what she says is that basically what happens here is the dirty water comes in here from the loo roll side and goes into these, I went ahead a bit, Go, goes into this loo roll, goes into this box, and the water gets a little bit clean, 
and then it comes down into this box, it gets a little bit more cleaned, and then it's able to be drank. So this dirty water that came in is filtered and is able to come out of the straw, and then she's able to drink uh, clean, safe water. My wife and the teacher were both in awe. My teacher, the teacher, first of all, was in awe because she said to my wife that normally nursery students are just learning to put things together. And the reason we give them this activity is to be able to assemble things and play with glue and boxes and figure out how to put things together. Three-year-olds normally don't have the, the knowledge and the, the forethought to come up with something as complex as a, as a water filtration system. And this is why my teacher, or the teach, Isa's teacher had called my wife into the classroom was to show my wife that your daughter at age three has, has thought about this, not only assembled these things together, but also thought about designing a system, in this case, a water filtration system that is uncommon. Uh, so I'm not giving this example to brag about my, my kids or anything, but this actually inspired me to think if, if my daughter at age three can think of a water filtration system, can I maybe do something similar with the testing pyramid? Could we make the testing pyramid more usable and do something more with it than just look at it and think, okay, UI tests need to be less than service tests. And then the unit tests need to be the widest part and need to be the most extensive. And it got me thinking, could we in fact use the testing pyramid as a filtration system? An interesting concept when you think about it on the surface. But what you would have essentially is something that we would call dirty water going in at the bottom of the pyramid and then some magic happening inside the pyramid and outcoming clean water. So that is in a nutshell, if I was to draw the analogy of the, the water filtration system, this is how it would kind of look if we were to apply it to the testing pyramid. We would turn the pyramid on its side. On one side, we would have dirty water coming in. We'd have some magic happening here, which I'm gonna get into here shortly. And then out comes a clear path on what we need to automate at the UI level, which would be really, really helpful for, for us as QAs. Because like I said, the conundrum here was what do I automate? I wanna know, I'm most concerned with what do I automate up here in this area at the UI level and at the top of the service level? Because I already have my developers doing some unit tests and working up the pyramid while I'm working down. So what is the dirty water in our case? Dirty water may not be the right name for it, but in our case, I think what we need to identify before we can start using the pyramid as a filtration system is we need to identify critical paths. So it's really, really important to define what a critical path is. I mean, there are industry standard definitions, but I think it's important as a QA team at your company to come up with your idea for your organization of what a critical path is. So this is something that I did with the, the QA team at Housie is we did this exercise of drafting up what we thought would define, would best define a critical path. And we came up with Housie's definition for a critical path. So the definition is kind of long, so you don't need to read the whole thing, but you can if you want to. What I want to focus on are the underlying parts. So critical paths is functionality performed by the end user to execute the most essential core activities of the system. 
and the key parts there are its functionality performed by the end user and it's the most essential core activity of the system. This is how we at Housey defined critical paths. So this would become the input into our pyramid filtration system. The next thing that was really, really important is to understand the difference between coverage and confidence. So these are two concepts that I think we're all familiar with as QAs and even as developers. The idea of coverage is really, 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 really sticks with developers and it's really, really easy to understand. They're always looking at the amount of code coverage, how many lines of code are covered by X unit tests and, and the like. But my counter argument to solely looking at coverage is this, is that you could have 100% coverage of your code, but is it good coverage? Or is it just coverage for the sake of coverage? You can have functions executing lines of code in your unit tests and it literally not do anything, but it touches your lines of code. So you'll get the coverage. The more important piece of the equation here is confidence. And as QA, we tend to think about confidence more, but I think it's really important for us as QA to use that, be ambassadors of confidence and teach the developers to not only focus on coverage, but to also focus on confidence. So when it comes to confidence, there's questions that you can ask. Like, these some of the questions you want to ask around confidence is that can we give confidence or assurance to our team that something has been tested thoroughly and that it works can we be confident that if something fails we will be notified via a failing test also can we be confident that our test won't flake and lastly can we be confident that our end users won't have a bad experience or counter, encounter any defects. These are all elements and things, questions that we can ask to try to establish that we are confident in what we are building as a, as a product development team. So with that definition, the, the definition of critical paths, and the ideas of coverage and confidence being instilled in the team. I go to the third piece of the, the third part of the tool toolbox that I, that I went to, which is Agile Scrum. So what in Agile Scrum can I use to help me as well? One of the things that I really like about Agile Scrum is the idea of bringing people together, the collaboration aspect of it. So we can look at Agile, we can make these decisions around what to automate in, in a silo, but it's probably not the best idea. It's always better to bring people in, get people on board with the idea, and then come up with a decision as a team because you're more likely to have buy-in on that idea or concept. So in referencing Agile Scrum, one thing that I really, really liked that kind of demonstrates the collaboration aspect of Agile Scrum is the idea of the three amigos. So for this pyramid filtration thing that we're about to do, could we use the three amigos type session to bring people together and get everybody's input and everybody's perspective? So it's not just QA putting things through the pyramid or it's not just developers putting things through the pyramid. It's the developers, it's the QA, 
it's the PMs and potentially even you could bring in the users and the, and, the, and your stakeholders into the meeting as well. Um, not necessarily external users, but in our case, we have internal users. So I could see a case where we would bring in a manager on the operation side uh, to this meeting to be able to go through this process and help us flush out what it is we need to test. They may not be able to give you the, the technical details, but they can give you uh, an idea of what are the most critical, uh, critical paths and also which ones of those help you prioritize which ones to, to look at. So with those three things in the toolbox, the testing pyramid, the devs writing unit tests, and the idea of the three amigos, can we take those critical paths that we now have definitions for, can we push them through the testing pyramid and come out with what we need to automate as QAs at the UI level. So traditionally the UI tests are often written by QAs. Um, not to say that we shouldn't get the developers on board with writing those, but for the purposes of this presentation, when I refer to us QAs writing UI tests, I'm only referring to it in that traditional sense, but there's nothing wrong with getting developers to help you with unit or the UI tests along with the service and unit tests. Again, it should be a collaborative effort when it comes to automation. So let's, let's try this. Let's clear the slate completely and we start with our critical paths. So in this case, we have six critical paths that we brought into the meeting. So at Housey, normally what we would do is the QAs would come up with a draft copy of the critical paths that we want to discuss at this Three Amigos session. And in this session, we would have, we had the PM, we had QA, and we have the developers. And the first thing to do is to kind of make sure that these critical paths are right. And that's again done through discussion. This is again why I think that the three amigos is so beneficial to this process is because you have everybody in the same room at the same time and you can have the discussion right there on the spot and essentially what you're doing is you're showing them a draft of these critical paths and you're getting their opinion and feedback on them are they right do they make sense are there some that you may have missed? So maybe initially you only had five identified and at the beginning of this meeting, you identify critical path number six. Um, so the first thing to do is to get these critical paths in a shape where everybody's happy with them. And then you go to the first level of the test pyramid, which is the unit test. And you have the developers in the room and you have, you've taken all these six critical paths in um, and you're asking some questions. First question you need to ask is, do we have enough coverage? So let's take critical path one, for example, the top one on the list there. Do we have enough coverage for it? Uh, and you, again, you have a discussion, right? And the developers oftentimes will chime in here and say that we have X number of unit tests for this. We feel like it's, it's pretty well covered, which, which is great, right? Um, and then you want to go to the next question. The more important question in my mind is, do we have enough confidence? So going back to those kind of questions I threw out earlier when you're talking about confidence, the question that I always come back to the developers with that I always fall back to is if something breaks, will there be a failing unit test that is going to alert me that something's wrong, right? Because this is going to increase my confidence. It's going to increase my confidence that, that, that our system is working as it should. And it's also going to increase my confidence in the unit tests and in our overall test suite as well. So asking, is there enough confidence is a really, really important question. 
along with the coverage. And then lastly, you want to ask, can we add more? So you've had a discussion around the unit tests. Um, you've asked about coverage. You've asked about confidence. The last thing to ask is, is there anything additional we can add? And you would do this for each of the critical paths. Uh, in this case, the six critical paths. And in our example here, we see that there's two critical paths which have kind of become dark green. And what dark green represents is, as a team, we've determined that those two critical paths, critical path one and critical path four, have enough coverage, uh, we have the confidence, and uh, we feel like they're fully covered to the point where we don't need to add anything more. We can leave it there and kind of check those ones off the list. You may still want to do some UI automation for the happy paths, and that's fine, but you can be confident at this point that we have enough coverage of critical path one and four, so you don't need to bring them to the service, service level. So that's why here we only have four arrows, because uh, these two, one and four, stopped at the unit test level. And then you run through similar questions at the service level. Again, do we have enough coverage of the endpoints for these critical paths? Do we have API tests in place for these? Um, do we have enough confidence? So sometimes there's things that can't be tested at the, the unit level and they automatically kind of come into the service level by the nature of, of the type of test they are. A good example of this would be an API test. Um, it'd be really hard to, you could mock and do it at the unit test level, um, but sometimes that proves to be difficult. One thing that my boss challenged me on when I first started at Housey was that we want to try to look at the testing pyramid from the top down and push things down the pyramid. So looking at, in his mind, looking at things at the UI level and thinking to ourselves, can we break this one UI test into two or three service tests and then maybe retire the UI test? And at the same time, can we take a service level test and break it down into multiple unit tests? And in theory, that's a good idea. And it's something that we try to do when we evaluate our UI tests. Can we break them down into multiple service level tests and retire the UI tests? And again, I, I'm constantly challenging the developers with the service level tests and trying to see if there's anything we can do to break it down into to multiple unit tests. Um, but sometimes that's just not possible. So in this case, in this example, we have four, four things here that need tests at the, at the service level. And we go through and we ask those questions. And lastly, we add, we ask, can we add more? So in our example here, look, three of those critical paths have coverage, have some coverage at the unit level and now have the remaining coverage that gives us coverage and confidence at the service level. And we have one critical path left on out of the six that now need to be automated at the UI level. So you went from six critical paths, which potentially could have, you could have ended up writing automation, UI automation for all six of those. You, through this process, you've managed to filter that down to where all you have to write now at the UI level is a UI test for that one critical path, as well as the happy path, end-to-end -end happy path scenarios, thus giving you a clear path to what you should start automating at the UI level. This really helped us as a team. It really helped me and my team at the Q, as a QA team figure out what to automate at the UI level and give us a clear direction. So 
before I conclude, I actually have a blog post. So I write blog posts, I try to write blog posts regularly on LinkedIn. Um, and one of the blog posts I've written recently is around this whole concept of this, this turning the permit on its side and using it as a filtration system. That's all discussed in that uh, LinkedIn post. But one of the things that I wanted to do this evening is give you guys something a little bit extra since you guys took time out of your schedule to be here and attend. And this is something that I haven't shared in that blog post and I don't plan on sharing outside of uh, the talks that I do is we have this idea of the pyramid and using it as a filtration system. But oftentimes we're throwing these ideas at meetups like this one. Um, and you go back to your team and you're thinking about how you can implement it. And oftentimes what, what I've struggled with, with some of the ideas that have been presented to me in the past is how do I document them? Right. This is a great idea, but how do I put it all on paper and, and like actually come up with a format that works. So I wanted to spend a few minutes before I wrap up here and we move to questions on how we did this at Housey. So firstly, we just started with a bullet point list. And I mean, this worked great for the first time round, but it became pretty apparent after going through this process two, three, four times that this is quite tedious, number one, to write. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is when you get to distributing this list, the bulleted list of stuff, and each point you have a scenario that does something and then you have notes underneath. And then this was really rough. It was like, we have some unit, to, unit coverage for this. Uh, we need API coverage. Uh, and then we only need happy path at the UI level. And this works, but it gets pretty, pretty ugly, pretty fast. So we realized pretty quickly that this isn't going to work. We need a better format. So I went back and I was thinking, okay, what, again, going back to the toolbox is what, what do I know? Or what have I learned during past experiences that can help me with this? So one thing that you may be familiar with is a, a, a RAGS system. So RAGS stands for red, amber, green. So I thought, can I, document this some way in using that RAG system uh, to help me easily present and convey the outcome of this Three Amigos session that we had where we took the pyramid and did all our filtering and stuff. Uh, so this is what I've come up with. Basically, under the title here, you can see what all the colors mean. So you, you make a, a table of sorts. And on this table, you list out all the critical paths there on the left side. And then you have U for unit, S for service, V for visual or UI. Um, and basically, you would go through these critical paths. And instead of all that verbose text, you would just color code it. So what this is telling me is that I have enough confidence and coverage, C and C, at the unit test level, it's green. Then move to the service level, uh, you could color that yellow, and that tells me going up here to the key, it says yellow has some coverage but needs more. So I can share this with either the QA team or the developer team, uh, to convey to them that in this meeting, we agreed that we need more coverage here. And you probably want to add a note um, under this somewhere uh, to, to give them more specific details if it's yellow. Uh, actually, I've accounted for that here. I just uh, saw that, uh, that uh, in the comments section, you can detail out what to, what to put. What, what exactly needs to be added for this? 
And then lastly, you'd have a red for the UI test in this case for critical path one. What this tells me is it doesn't have any coverage. Uh, we need to do some work here, but we definitely need it. So what you get is something that looks like this. And this is a lot more easier to digest, a lot more easier to consume, a lot more easier to communicate with than a long list of bulleted items on a sheet of paper or on a, on a Google Doc. Uh, this just seems to work a lot better. So in this case, let's look at just as another example, Critical Path 2. So Critical Path 2 had some coverage at the unit level, needed more, uh, had no coverage at the service level, level, but needs coverage. And then visuals grayed out. So what does that mean? Gray means um, not required. So for Critical Path 2, as a team, we decided we need some more coverage at the unit level. We need to add coverage at the service level. And if we do those two things, this will be detailed in the comments, um, that we feel confident enough that we have enough coverage that we don't need any UI or visual tests. And then Critical Path 3, as a team, we've decided this isn't a re really a critical path. We don't even need this one. So we just grade it out. So that's one way that you can document. And again, I encourage you guys to explore ways that work for you. What I've presented is just one potential way to do it, but you have to see what fits. And the way you do that is through collaboration, through using what you know about Agile Scrum, uh, what you know about working with people, working with developers, working with your PMs to come up with a way that works best for you. So the key takeaways here are, number one, leverage your toolbox. So in this case, I've leveraged unit tests and the developers are already writing them. I leveraged the testing pyramid which I've learned so, so much about over, over my years in QA. And I leveraged the three amigos from Agile Scrum. Second takeaway is use the pyramid as a practical tool. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that when Mike Cohen introduced this test pyramid, he introduced it kind of as a, as a concept or a model to help generate ideas. I, I see it as something that we should be able to use practically. And the way that I managed to do that is turning it into a filtration system for my critical paths and using that to help drive what I automate. And lastly, key takeaway is make the outcomes easy to read and digest. So we had that long bulleted list and we kind of changed that to a rags table to make it easy to read and digest. And I think if you're able to do that, you would have solved your test automation conundrum. And specifically bullet point two there is what solves the conundrum, my conundrum in this case, of what do I automate? That's how I solved it. With that, Let's move to questions. Uh, just scrolling up here. Does anybody have a question they want to ask in person? Using the power of human voice, probably be quicker than going through these. I'll, uh, I'll happily jump in, Sophia, and ask a question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so you, you uh, put it on the chat, but you, you mentioned that one of the, the tools in your testing toolbox was that developers were already writing unit tests. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be interested to know, um, let's say if you're in an environment where they aren't doing this, how would you have approached that into coaching them into doing so? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's one that, I think many people struggle with uh, 
it's it's really about with, with anything really it's really about demonstrating value so anything anything that you want to bring in whether it be writing unit tests or you know introducing a definition of ready and definition of done in order to be able to do that i think the key is to demonstrate value of it um and and you really have to find an ally when it comes to unit tests. If your developers are currently not writing it, writing them, uh, finding, well, the way I would approach it is, is find an ally on the dev team, find somebody that is doing it, and find somebody that sees value in it. Um, I'm sure that if you have a team of five or six developers, um, that at least one of the developers will be writing some unit tests some of the time. And what you want to do is you want to approach him or her and understand why they're doing it, how they're doing it, what they're doing, um, and having a conversation with them. And then really engaging with them in a dialogue and in putting together something that you can bring to the rest of the team. And through that process, maybe you pair up with that developer and you come up with hey we have x feature and we have this other stuff going on as well and let's figure out a way to show that writing unit tests for feature x uh improves the quality of of our application and what you can do is you can take a sprint maybe have the example of the unit test that you wrote and how it's once once things start going wrong for that feature it starts alerting you because unit tests start failing and then you have everything else that you don't get any notification and all of a sudden now you're starting to track results or see results and if you're able to do that and demonstrate the value through an example through pairing with a developer and maybe running a proof of concept through that, uh, I think that opens up the doors when the rest of the team sees those results and the rest of the team sees that, hey, you know what? That's actually kind of cool that when we run these unit tests, it's, it's telling us that there's a bug and the, and the best, the best um, the time when this sticks the most is when it actually starts revealing real issues. When we introduced the Cypress automation at Housey, when we, the first time that a, a Cypress test started failing and it was a, it was a legitimate issue, I, I waved my hand and, and um, made a huge, a huge deal out of it. That look, Cypress is finding these real bugs. And that's, that's really how you can increase the confidence in the team to adopt practices such as writing unit tests. Hopefully that answered your question, Billy. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Abita, you have your hand raised. Go for it. Hi. Hi, Sufian. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, good presentation. That's good, uh, very interesting. Um, the question I had was in terms of um, choosing the automation tool, it's interesting you went to say no to Selenium. Not, I've not heard that many people say no to Selenium. But is there any reason you've gone for Cypress? Um, the conundrum I've got is in terms of testers, when choosing an automation tool, they're less technical. So I, I tend to opt for things like Catalon, so it makes it easy for them to learn automation. But uh, does Cypress have that ability to make it easier? I'm not seeing Cypress myself, you see. Yeah, so yeah, I, I would say, say, same for me. I don't consider myself a, an SDET where I'm a software developer and test by any stretch. So I'm kind of in the same or similar boat that you mentioned there, Abit, where Abita, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I don't want to be in a position where I'm having to write hundreds and thousands of lines of code to get my automation tests up and running. Um, I want something that's fairly easy to comprehend and would be fairly easy to understand for non-technical testers as well. Um, so yeah, I do see Cypress kind of falling into that category. Uh, Cypress has 
tools that allows you to inspect elements by literally, you, it has, number one, it has a GUI. So it has an interface that you can use. And secondly, it has a, has a tool where you could literally just click on it and then you go down to your, um, your, your application or whatever and you point on what you want and it'll tell you the, the selector to use uh, for that element on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, Cypress is probably a little more, more technical than maybe some of the other like totally GUI front end type tools, but it is on the relatively easier side than something that is powered by Selenium. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why I actually opted for Cypress is because it was literally, you didn't even have to do an NPM install. You could, if, if you didn't even know how to do an NPM install through your command line, you could literally go to their website and download it. They had an actual download button. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Uh, it was just the angle where we're trying automation. So what we, what I tell the testers to do is, is just do proof of concept, just do spikes. Uh, we've got nothing to lose. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But Selenium, as you know, is, isn't that easy to just download and get started. It needs almost a developer to be pulled in to say, help, help me, help me kind of thing. But yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? There's a number of questions coming in here. Um, Matthew asked, what recommendations would anyone have for automation of database application tier, which are typically headless? Um, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Does anyone else want to jump in with that one? Okay. I'll just jump in with that one. We, we do have a SAP group that's on our meetup page. Um, and you, you can, it, that question, even though it's not answered on, on this call, uh, you, you can put that question on there and, and hopefully someone will be able to help. So that's in the Quality Advocates SAP group, right, Billy? Yeah, so on the Quality Advocates meetup page, um, there's a link to our SAP group where people can sign up. Um, and ask questions to, and we've got over about a hundred members so far. Hmm. Cool. Um, Michael, interesting comment. Testers don't give confidence. Others provide information for others to establish confidence. Absolutely agree with that. Um, any other questions? What could you replace critical paths with risks? Christian asks. Uh, would you mind elaborating on that a bit more, Christian? No? Maybe he's away from his machine. Um, I, I, I guess you could replace critical paths with anything, really. If you want to call it, call them risks, yeah, you could. You could just swap out critical paths for risks and put risks in. Um, I think they're almost, and the reason I'm struggling with this is because I think they're almost, they're, they're very much related to each other um, because critical paths really, in my mind, are essentially risks in the system, hence why they're called, hence why they are critical paths. But there's, I, don't, I don't think there's a problem with swapping out critical paths for risks is really about whatever it is you want to make sure that you have enough confidence and coverage for. I hope that answers your question. Bugya asks, was the UI test are separate from the main code or part of it? So yeah, as I mentioned at the top, one of the things that I looked into was using the same framework that the developers use. That is one option. In our case, we opted to use a separate um, framework. So we went with Cypress. So it does not live in the main code base, but as part of our uh, continuous integration, it does run the Cypress tests every time something is deployed. 
Um, and I think that's the most important thing to make sure that you're getting value from, from the test that you're writing. And the, the way to do that in the present day is to really make sure you're moving towards that whole DevOps mentality and that these tests are adding value and um, are giving you results each and every time you deploy. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, just one more question. Um, yep. So you're saying that um, you're bringing the critical parts. So are you bringing the critical parts of the previous sprint um, or the upcoming sprint work? Because in upcoming sprint, anyway, there won't be work done, isn't it? So um, are you bringing the finished sprint work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the way that we're looking at this kind of filtration is on a project basis. So you would probably, and, and this is something that after the, the talk in March that I gave, um, someone asked a similar question once I did the blog post as well around at what point in the, in the life cycle of a project or of, of sprints should you be doing this? Uh, originally, you know, so firstly, let me say that we do this on a project level. So you'd have a project, for example, we introduced a notification system, right? So at the point in time where we had some of the plumbing for the notification system in place and the system was kind of coming together, um, we kind of held this session, the Three Amigos session to understand what, what level of automation we need, where we need that automation, and where we put it in place. It could be done on a sprint by sprint basis, uh, but I, hadn't ever, I haven't ever approached it like that. Could it be done? I think so. And I think you would want to do it probably as soon as you, the team has clarity around what they're building. Um, so you don't necessarily need a product to be done and, and developed to be able to start thinking about what level of coverage you need. You could probably take your user stories, and this is an idea, again, that, that was, came up as a, as a discussion on LinkedIn. You can actually find that if you go find that blog post around the sooner you can do this. So once, once the user stories or even while the user stories are being written, you guys already kind of know the business rules and the acceptance criteria, and you kind of already have an idea of what you want to test. It's just about now coming together and figuring out where we want to test it. Number one, do we want to automate this? Is it worth automating? Number two, then you go into what level can we automate this at? You're probably if you can convince your developers to write the unit tests, which we answered earlier, they're probably already going to write unit tests. So now it's all only about, do we need, do we need some service tests? And you can do this off of the acceptance criteria and figure out, does this ticket involve any endpoints? If it does, probably going to be worth writing a, a, a ser service level test for it, at least one, maybe more. And then lastly, you're going to have a discussion around, the other acceptance criteria, which may be the, the interface and the front end, the UI, and having a discussion around what we need to automate there. And that discussion essentially is what we just talked about. So I don't do it at the sprint level yet, but I, I would say give it a try and see how it goes. And I would say try to do it for the sprint try to do it in advance of, of a sprint as part of your refinement or part of your, it wouldn't probably be, it wouldn't be part of the planning, probably want to be before planning. Um, and then maybe it's a separate meeting to a refinement session. Does that help? Yes, thank you. It gave me a few ideas. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. great idea. I'd be really, really curious um, if you do give this a try to let me know how it goes if you do Definitely. the sprint, yes. sprint level. Thank you very much. Um, cool. Great questions. Uh, just scrolling through the chat. Uh, is this webinar going to be recorded? I'm pretty sure it is based on 
the other webinars that Billy's been putting on. Uh, what's the difference between software automation and ML automation? What is ML automation? I don't know. Uh, software automation from the DevOps perspective. Say that again. ML is machine learning. Machine learning. Okay, I don't have a whole lot of experience with machine learning. Um, but as far as software automation versus DevOps, they are, in my mind, software automation helps us achieve more of a DevOps philosophy um, or the DevOps perspective. Uh, so what DevOps says, is, so I don't know how familiar everyone is with DevOps, but the symbol that comes to mind is an infinity sign, right? And Dan Ashby has a great model out there um, around testing in that, in that, on that infinity loop that's kind of become synonymous with DevOps um, is that at every point in the life cycle, you want to be automating or you want to be not automating, sorry, you want to be testing. Um, so anywhere where you're testing on that, DevOps loop, um, you could ask the question of, is this something that I want to automate? Is it, and do I do this through just general software automation or do I take it to another level and do machine learning automation? Um, which again, like I said, I, I don't have much experience with um, machine learning automation yet, but it's something that I'm, I'm definitely interested in. Uh, but I hope I answered your question around DevOps and software automation. Software automation is an aspect that can be incorporated into DevOps. Did that help? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Very useful perspective from PM. Um, cool. All right. Well, we're at an hour and five minutes. Um, I know this was scheduled for for two hours on the meetup. I don't think it was intended that long unless Billy has something else planned. But um, <laughs> if there are no more questions, um, then I'll turn it back over to Billy. Last call for questions. All right, thanks guys. Really appreciate you taking your evening to join us and um, hopefully our paths will cross again. And if you have any thoughts or feedback, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my name's not um, that popular, so you probably won't have any trouble finding me. I'm also in the Quality Advocate Slack channel as well. So feel free to reach out. And if you give this a try, I'd love to know how it goes for you. Thank you. Back to Billy. Good stuff. Thanks very much, Sipian. Um, some, some really good insights there. And already seen from the comments, but people seem to really enjoy it. Um, so thanks for yeah thanks for your insights and, and sharing your journey on the challenges but also the wins that, that you faced since joining Aldi. Um, just to add, of course, we we do have a Slack group. So if people want to join, check out the Quality Advocates Meetup page or reach out to me directly on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, but just want to say a huge thank you for for coming along. Uh, it's been great to keep this community alive during these difficult times, and just want to give one last shout out to Sipian for a really great talk. So thanks very much, everyone. Have a nice evening and stay safe.